Good morning, Calvary Church. Y'all ready to worship with me this morning? Would y'all sing? The future is brighter. I'm believing his promise for me. I believe that he's working and he's not done. The best, the best is yet to come. I know he makes the anxious courageous. I know he makes the doubters believe. I know he won't stop working and he's not done. The best. The best is yet to come. I've got this hope in my soul. I know you won't let me go. Lord, I believe with your love in me. I've just begun. The best is yet to come. I believe that he gives second chances. I believe he works all things for good. I believe that he's working and he's not done. The best, the best is yet to come. I've got this hope in my soul. I know you won't let me go. Lord, I believe with your life in me, I've just begun. Hope in my soul. I know you won't let me go. Lord, I believe with your life in me, I've just begun. The best is yet to come. I've got my hopes high. You make my hopes rise. I've got my hopes high. You hold my whole life, I've got my hopes high. You make my hopes rise, I've got my hopes high. You hold my whole life, I've got my hopes high. You make my hopes rise, I've got my hopes high. You hold my whole life, I've got my hopes high. You make my hopes rise, I've got my hopes high. You hold my whole life. This hope in my soul, I know you won't let me go. Lord, I believe with your life in me, I'm just begun. I got this hope in my soul, I know you won't let me go. Lord, I believe with your life in me. Just begun. The best is yet to come. Woo! Hey, you, if you thought 2020 was bad, I promise the best is yet to come. Amen. Hey, so this morning we've got a student style service. Uh, we're not going to do small groups yet because that's not what we do, but on Wednesday nights we do. But tonight this is our student band. Can we get up for student worship team? But it's not just students, it's also those who are student leaders, leaders of students, people who maybe are recently from being in students, because those who know serve. And so can we give it up for those who are serving today and leading our younger people? Thank you so much. And so ushers, if you'd make your way down, I'm gonna pray so we can receive the offering. And as, after we receive the offering, we have uh, some announcements and a couple more songs. God, thank you so much for 2,020 years ago, the best gift you've ever given us. All the ways that you provided and blessed us are just extra on top. And God, I pray that right now people would choose to remember who you are and give back to you. God, by giving back to you, they help us be the church, not only in this building, raising up disciples and people who could know you and encounter you and choose you, but God, in our community, we're able to reach people with your generosity and your love and your goodness. So help those people choose to be faithful, knowing that you will give all that we need. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. 
So real quick, some announcements. The, uh, there's a senior strip coming up in March 24th. This, uh, the sign-up sheet just got released. It's in the Connection Center. You can check that out, get signed up. Also, if you haven't brought your food items back, I think you know what's going on. You can see all those. By the way, can we just say thanks, God, for allowing us to be a part of that. Thank you, God, for all those things out there. Also, don't forget, we have a room full of presents now, but that adoptive family presents and those foods. We needed those today. However, we know that things happen in life. Maybe you couldn't get the clothing item or the, such an item of food for a family, and they're coming in at a later date. We'll take groceries all the way until Thursday. That way on Friday, Saturday, or Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we can start to package them up where they'll go. The doors will be open if you have to bring those. Right now, we've got a couple more songs, so let's get ready to worship. God, help us to continue to chase you and choose you. God, there's nothing quite like gathering together to worship you with others who are seeking after you. Help us to respond how you'll have us respond, to let loose and praise you and remember who you gave us so long ago as the best gift ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. things. 
Sing it one more time. Blameless. search the world but he couldn't feel me a man's empty press and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together now every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing is better. Yes, I know it's true. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me free. Cause I got a Is a God of the valley. Yeah. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better. 
One more time, church. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this service today. We thank you for the families that are here. And I just pray that you would touch the lives of every individual person in this room today. Speak through Seth. Speak through his message. Help us to go out into the community this week and work your gospel, Lord. We don't want this to stop here. Continue on. Don't leave this room today without showing him through you. Lord, I pray that you would just open the hearts of every individual in this room and bless this service. These things I ask in your name. Amen. Oh. Uh. Oh. Malik! I need a Malik! 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 Oh my god, my foot! Oh. Oh. I just need you to get it out of my foot. What's that? Roll a thing. Oh, I'll be fine, I'll get it out of my foot. Oh. 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 Anybody have You're a going home. Going that's a real life documentary of what it feels like if you haven't. I know I was the reason for a lot of uh, Legos and feet as a, as a young kid. Uh, I never made anything great. I was more of the getting the Lego in the foot kind of kiddo. Nothing like a, you know, there's people who have made things out of Legos like a running car. I don't even know how you, like, I've never even really made anything by the manual of Legos that was like this big, let alone a full functioning car or home. Uh, but for a couple of years ago, for the first time I decided to make some Legos um, by the manual, and no, not me, I didn't get them for Christmas, my nieces did, although I wouldn't hate Legos for Christmas. Uh, so I was able to be with them, and we sat through, and we did the whole Legos through the manual, which it takes a lot less time to do things by the manual than by yourself. I don't know what that's about. Yeah, right. And so after we finished completing the fairy house, yes, I built a fairy house, what are you going to do? My nieces and I did the same thing that I did when I was their age. We just left the Legos laying around. That's what you do with Legos, right? No, it's not what you do with Legos. And so what I hope to do today is uh, show a better way than where my brain was at two years ago. Maybe you're the same way. It's easy to forget and just leave things and not do what you're supposed to with them. That's why my wife, apparently clothes don't go beside the laundry hamper. They go in it. I don't know who, show me where it says that. <laughs> my face, wow. And so today I hope that we can do something because we're coming up on an awesome opportunity. You don't want to go to someone's house this holiday season and step on a, a Lego just scattered out on the ground. That wouldn't feel great. And I'm sure the same is for you. I'm sure your home is being cleaned and uh, you, don't wanna, you don't want any guests to step on Legos. Um, and by the way, if you're doing this holiday season alone, please know that at Calvary Church, um, we love you. We don't want you to do life alone. If you're going to be alone for Christmas, we can find someone in Calvary family to do life with you. I promise you. But Christmas and Easter have these amazing effects of people coming to church for the first time in a long time or for the first time ever. So today, in order to point people to our only hope, we're gonna pick up some Lego pieces. Make sure that when those first time guests or the first time in a long time people come back, they don't step on things that keep them from getting to the hope that they so desperately need. If you're on board with me, let me hear you say something. Amen? Amen. All right. You said it. I recorded it. By the way, if you're with us online, go ahead and let us know you're on board with picking up Legos. That way we can be in this together. Because no matter where you are, sometimes you can't gather here physically. We can be the church wherever we are at. This is a church service. We are the church. And we just agreed to do this Lego picking up thing. Which is why I'm going to call this of part, uh, this two-part series, Our Only Hope, today's message is titled, Coffee Mug Christianity. 
you know, there's funny sayings on coffee mugs. Sometimes people put scripture on a coffee mug. Sometimes there's very inappropriate stuff on coffee, mu- coffee mugs. Uh, but I've got a cool, a few cool coffee mugs I'm going to show you this morning. Check this one out. It says, catch up, like the Heinz ketchup, get it? Uh, with Jesus, let us praise him and relish him. Because he loves me from my head to tomatoes. This one is from a picture in my home. This is actually my mug. I'm not arguing. I'm just explaining why I'm right. Jesus loves this hot mess. Amen? He does love this one. And I know, I know if you haven't been on board with anything I've ever said, you're going to agree today with me. My favorite childhood memory is not paying bills. Amen? And the last one, just because I want you to know, sarcasm is just another service I offer. It's free. All I ask you to do is tie 10%. Hey, so some of these are, they're great. They're funny. Coffee mugs can be great. A lot of times um, we get coffee mugs, and I think we have probably more than most people. My wife prefers the simple, elegant, maybe like an ombre color effect with some sparkles. That's her. She's elegant, simple, and beautiful, and she's great. Mine, I like to get coffee mugs from whatever cool coffee shop I visited. I just like the memories. I didn't go a lot of places as a kid. We didn't travel, and so now I like to remember the places that I did get to go. And I share those things about our types of coffee mugs because I think the problem is, or it doesn't have to be a problem, but oftentimes the coffee mug says more about the person than the thing inside of the cup, okay? And so I want to make sure that the things that we say regularly are the right things, that they're not like little cliches, Legos that lead to pain rather than to hope. So today we're going to be talking about eliminating cliches from Calvary Church, from Christianity, following Christ, that don't actually point to our only hope. They're more like a Lego in the middle of the floor that you didn't mean to step on. So that's what we're going to do today. We've seen the pictures. We know what we've got. And as I do these things, um, I hope to communicate um, why we got to get rid of cliche. So the, let me, if you don't know what cliche means, if you're thinking, what's that French word? Well, it is a French word, so good. But here's what it means. And if you're mad at this definition or you disagree, um, this is from Oxford University. So get a doctorate and then tell them they're wrong. Because a phrase or opinion that is overused and betrays a lack of original thought. I don't know about you, but I have been saved and serve a God who does not lack thought. And so there's 66 books of this proof. His son came on purpose for a purpose, not just randomly to like, you know, God didn't just say, I made you, you blew it, but I love you, he died for you, now we're done. There's a lot of stuff in between these amazing stories of life and what God worked out in his promises for us and what we do and how it points to him. So we don't, we don't take shortcuts and lack in the way we share things of our, our family, our culture, who we are, what Christ is actually all about and following him is all about. So I hope to answer four questions with each cliche that I present to you today. And the questions that I hope to answer about each one of these cliches is, when do we tend to use this cliche? What does uh, each cliche communicate that's a misbelief or not true about God? Uh, what does scripture actually tell us? Um, and I promise if we ever get a chance to do conversations, like I talked with Charlie Paralore McCutcheon one time for like an hour and a half, I came to eat hot rolls and we was just going through every deep theological question in God's word. And I love those things. But people often ask me, well, what do you think, Seth? And I say, well, it doesn't matter what I think, but I know that God's word says, right? And so what does scripture say is where we always need to go because it's good. And the last one is, what do we do? Now that we know this, what do we do with said cliche? Do we get rid of it? Do we change it? Uh, So we're gonna do those things. Um, But before I continue on to that, um, I... Preparing this message, it was very hard to go through and weed out some of these and say in a way that um, I remove how the enemy could make you stop listening. Uh, And like a kid who was frustrated and wanted to quit Legos, I found myself thinking, no, I just won't do that one. But that made me remember that I'm not a quitter anymore because I have God's word and I know what is actually true. And so in order for you to know that sometimes some of these things may not come across the best way. I have ADD, my brain goes quick. But here's what I want you to know. If, in, if I ever say anything that's confusing, if I don't communicate clearly, if you think I'm wrong, if you want to go deeper, 
We have a new texting, uh, text your questions to number that I put on the screen right here. You could take a picture of it or save it to your phone. And during, during my message, if a question comes in, you're like, well, what about this? If I can fit it into the message, I want to answer your question. I want you to be able to be a Berean and question things so that you could have that understanding of your own faith. And if I don't get back to it today, throughout the week, I promise you, somebody, myself or Randy, will get back to you with an answer of a question because we want people to know and make it easy to know who Christ is and what he has for them. Amen? So, cliche number one. Everything happens for a reason. When do we typically use this cliche? Um, Hopefully it never happened, but maybe when someone uh, loses their home, their marriage is falling apart, COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 that caused someone to lose their job. Well, you know, everything happens for a reason. So we tend to use this when we have an opportunity to bear someone's burden with them, the way that God's word tells us to do. We tend to use these as probably an escape from having to really come alongside them and do life with them. We say, yeah, you're fine. Look, everything happens for a reason. There's some hope. Which, listen, in all sense, I mean, that's kind of fair. We want to point them towards hope. But we don't want to, boom. We don't want to pretend to care. And so, there's a better way to do this. Um, I understand, because on a macro level, we absolutely believe everything happens for a reason. God is sovereign. But if we're not careful, the misbelief, the the untrue thing about God that this communicates is that he causes everything to happen, and that is not true. Because if God causes everything to happen, he is not good. And I tell you, God is good. Not God is all good, God is good. If it is good, it is God. He cannot be bad, he is not evil, he is good. And so what we have to know is that all things happen because God caused them or God allowed them to happen. Look in the book of Job, you see the way it's set up. I think that's really one of the biggest purposes of Job, not to only show us how to endure, but the idea that God doesn't cause those things. He allows them to happen. And so whatever you're going through today, I hope that at some point, nobody's ever told you this. If you've ever thought that God was making this bad thing happen to you, I'm sorry that you've misunderstood who God is and what he has for you, because he would never make these things happen. He does not give your kid cancer. God allows us to do these things because he loves us, he respects us, he's given us free will. Because if we were just robots doing everything he said, that's not love, and God knew that. So be, unfortunately, free will leads to not good things because sometimes we choose Satan's plan rather than God's plan for, our good, for his life for us. And so what's a better way? How do we say this better? Well, first let's see where it came from because I think someone maybe misused Romans 8.28 and got here somehow. So let's do like we do. And we know that for those who all things work together for, and for those who are called according to, okay. So one, um, if you use this as advice about God, you must be assuming that that person has salvation because things don't work for good for people who don't love God and who aren't living in his purpose. And so you can't even tell people that it could work for good if you don't know. But you can remind them of this. Because we have to love God for things that work for good. So I don't ever want to give someone false assurance if I don't know where they're at. I don't say, well, God will work it out for good. Maybe. You still have to let him and live in his will for you. And so a better way to say this moving forward is not everything happens for a reason. And, and before we move on to how to say it better, wait, too late. Uh, if you love God and seek to do his will, everything that happens in your life can be used for good, can be used to, for the glory of God. But please don't use this as a way to help people in suffering. Can you imagine losing um, a loved one? Something, just something bad that's happened in your life recently. Um, I learned uh, a couple years ago from a really wise guy, uh, Luther Ramsey, if you see this, I still think you're really old, but I love you. He's a mentor in my life. He was my executive pastor at my previous church who really helped. Uh, anytime me and Lene wanted to be better examples of God's love and better husbands and wife, these were the people we'd go to. And he told me, I was doing my first funeral, and I was so overwhelmed uh, with not wanting to let the family down. And uh, he said, man, you don't have to know what to say. Sometimes all you have to do is live out Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice 
and weep with those who weep. Sometimes that's all Christ followers need to do for people. We don't got to fix all of their problems and immediately pull them out of their pain. We come alongside them and allow Christ and the Holy Spirit to do the, the stuff that need, is needed to change them. Amen? So we know a better way for that one. Number two, God will never give you more than you can handle. Well, that's 100% wrong. Let me just say that. And if it makes you feel better, if it'll help you not be defensive in case you said this, I used to say this. I probably used to believe this. Um, and so it's okay to be there. I'm just asking you. Actually, uh, I want to lead you to getting rid of this because this entire statement is not accurate. But I know where they probably got it from. Uh, we tend to give this to people in similar situations um, uh, that are hard, rough, traumatic, uh, pain invoking. Um, but it won't, it won't show them who God really is. And I think in 1 Corinthians 10 13, sorry, in 10 13, we see a better way. So, no temptation has overtaken you that is common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be beyond. But with the temptation, we'll also provide the way of escape that be able to endure it. So here's what we see by this. Tempted. You can't handle a single temptation. I just want you to know that. You can choose God's plan for your life, and the Spirit can defeat all of those things, but you have to choose it. Everything the spiritual side, the dark principalities do against us, uh, your flesh can't overcome it. But with temptation, who? Who does that say? He, God. God is the way through it and the way out of it. But you still have to allow him to be that. You still have to seek him and his will for you and love him because it says you may. You may be able to. It doesn't say you will. It says he's going to give you the ability to choose him in a better way, in a way out of the temptation. But how awesome is it that God won't ever give you anything that he won't provide a way out of. And that's how we learn that we're never going to be, we are never able to do it without God. So I think, I don't even have to spend a lot of time on this one because it's so easy to just show you how this is not true. I think a better way to say this is God often gives us more than we can handle, but never more than he can handle. Imagine how that would change a new believer's understanding of who God is when things don't go their way. Imagine how that would change our personal faith if we knew that just because it's not going well doesn't mean that he can't take care of it at some point. That he won't help us get something good from it because he is good. This next one that I'm going to share took me the most time. I, I almost didn't say this one because it's true, but it's it's not fair. It's not enough. It definitely lacks clear clarity and intent. So this next one is one of the things, cliches, right? We've got we to gotta say something else. Because this is true, but uh, here we go. Prayer works. Well, that's not fair to prayer. If we're not careful, this can communicate uh, that prayer is a vending machine. So you can push a button and get what you want from God. Uh, and I promise you, my friends, it is not. Scripture makes it clear that it is not that. And can you imagine praying for years and years and years and years, and then you come up and you tell me prayer works? Well, then I must not have a relationship with God because I've been praying. And I don't want to be the reason when someone comes back to give us a chance during the Christmas season that we convince them that they don't have the ability to know who God is because their prayers weren't given to them or answered in the way that they would prefer them. I don't want people to say, God didn't do what I wanted him to do. We want to lead others into a better way. And I think we can do that and communicate that prayer still works, regardless if you get your prayer requests, regardless if you lose that job you wanted. And I think Paul tells us in Acts, or excuse me, in Romans 8, 26, proof that we can't, why we can't say this. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we, you don't know, to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. 
How can you say prayer works when you don't even know what you're praying for? That's a, real, that's a weird one to wrestle with. We don't even know to, what to pray for. I'll try to give an illustrative to maybe help provide an understanding, but again, I don't think that this is 100% the way. This is just meant to maybe give you some kind of human visual as to what it could be like. Me, pray to God. God, I love you so much. Will you please give me a big home or at least a brick oven for pizzas? That's a good prayer, I think. I mean, that's of my heart. <sighs> yeah, you know I love pizza. But you know what the Holy Spirit does? I imagine it's probably something like this. <sighs> oh my God. So because the Spirit represents us, he then says, hey God, would you please be patient with him and give him opportunities to seek what you want for him and to be content with what you've already given him? What if that's how prayer works? I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying we don't even know what we're supposed to be praying for. And I don't wanna communicate that prayer is what you want. Now, here's what I would tell you. You better be petitioning God in prayer. You better be asking stuff of him. You are supposed to ask stuff of him. But it cannot be to a point to where when you don't get you what you wanted from prayer, that you stop loving him. And I think if we're not careful, prayer works. That cliche alone can communicate to that people. Because prayer absolutely works, believe that. But I think a better way to say this is prayer changes us, works to change us more than it changes God. Prayer's about changing us more than it is to change God. So it's gotta be that relationship. We've gotta pursue that relationship. The fourth cliche, number four, uh, and I've heard this one a bit, um, and I just, I know that when you can finally uh, not require this or not need this to have a personal relationship with Christ that is going, that's when you really have the understanding of who he is. And the fourth one is, I could really feel God's presence. And here's what I mean by that. What happens, I'm new to faith, haven't been here in a long time, or maybe something's not going great, and I hear you say that. Well, I don't really feel his presence. Maybe I, God doesn't want me in his presence. And nowhere in scripture does it tell us his presence is based off of our feelings. Scripture says that God is omnipresent and everywhere. So if you could really feel him, then why didn't you feel him before this moment? And if you find yourself here on a Sunday morning, be like, man, I could really, maybe you know some things like, I could really feel God this morning here. Was it because you liked the songs? Because you liked all five of the songs? Was it because everyone was in here and their hands were up? You could feel God's presence? Was it the goosebumps? God's presence is everywhere. And he is with you once you become where he lives. And we could see that. Paul tells us those things. In Acts 17, 24. And so he's talking to somebody, he's talking to some people um, who have an altar that says the unknown God. And he's trying to make some clarifications on who and what and how things actually work. And so what he says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not made by man. God's presence is not in this building when you aren't here. It's everywhere, but your ability to feel it cannot be based off of your location. Your ability to feel it needs to be based off of knowing. Faith is knowing, not feeling. Feelings may be real, but we talked about this before. They mislead you. They're, they're a gauge of maybe something that is actually keeping you from understanding the closeness and presence of God that's freely available to you. Because the only thing, we know this, to separate you from God, which is why Christ came 2,020 years ago, is sin. The only thing that separates him is sin. So instead of seeking out the times when you could really feel his presence, you should be weary of selfward in introspection to find what is separating you from living in that every day. Because how are you supposed to be a light Monday through Saturday if you don't feel his presence? It's gonna be tough. And if my feelings dictated my faith, not having kids probably would have made me quit chasing God a long time ago. 
Maybe losing your, your home, your car, a loved one. Something would make you choose it if it was all based off of faith, our feelings. And so I think a better way to say this one, and we've got to change it because on our worst days, he is with us. On the days that everything falls apart, he's with us. When we are hurting, he's with us. No matter what we're going through, he is with you as long as you are within him. So I would say, let's just stop saying that. And, but, but the reason I would say that is because once you have that understanding, the feelings of his presence are no longer more about making you assured in your faith, but deeper moments of treasuring of an understanding that finally sank a little bit deeper. And so I say delete it, but until you can get to the point where you, uh, your feelings aren't the primary thing, if, if that's still where you are, because look, whatever I say, God knows more and can use anything that I think is not the best way God can still do stuff with. If he can use me for his plan, he can use anything. God is with me even when I don't feel it. That's what you have to live your life with. Because even in the moments when the enemy is right there trying to get you, God is with you. You just have to choose him. The next cliche um, is the most important to get rid of right now because of the season that it is. Um, when people come back here, we want to communicate the true uh, characteristic of God and truth about God that his word tells us that this one completely gets wrong. And this next one is, God helps those who help themselves. I'm not sure where that got, uh, I don't know if it was capitalist America that got us into thinking this, that if you want ahead, you can get ahead, you just gotta keep working harder. Um, now, I want people to be able to help themselves but you preparing for six months is not a prerequisite for God to save you. Matter of fact, in just a few moments, I want you to know there's not another thing you need to do but respond to the idea that you cannot help yourself. In Scripture, here's what Scripture says about this one, because we can just change this one really quickly. Here's what Scripture says. But God shows his love for us and that we were still, Christ died for us. So you were still a sinner and he died for you? So it appears to me that God helps only those who cannot help themselves. And I've met a lot of people who struggle with receiving help from others. Uh, there's some pride that you have to get rid of before you're able to receive help. Uh, but I want you to know that an inability to receive freely offered help from love might be an indicator of you not understanding God's love requires nothing of you because you can't do anything to earn it anyways. And I tell you, when you understand that principle, your whole faith will change. You will seek out help at any moment when you've come to a place that you no longer know how to chase God further, when you need help somewhere. This is such a freeing thing. And this is the culture that we have to give to newcomers, people who are returning to faith who have left the church. We have to let them know that it's okay to not be able to help yourself. We want to come alongside you. And see, what I think this does is what a lot of these cliches have done. And they've removed the personal relationship that is required of us with people and their burdens and their life. The same way that Christ came to do life with us and save us from them and not just give us one-liners. And so every time I prepare a message, I hope to tell you what I think God wants you to know and why he wants you to know it. And why he wants you to know it is because we cannot stand, we cannot afford to be the reason that so someone shows up to a Sunday service seeking God and they find us. They need to be able to easily find God. Not step on these Lego cliches that we think are one-liners to help people get their healing. Let's make it easy to point to who he really is and what his word says. And so as we do these things, as we search these out, this is why you need to know it. I always want to be able to tell you, what do you need to do? With what you know now, what do you need to do? And why do you need to do it?
And so one of the things that you probably need to do, and I'm going to challenge you, uh, one of the things we do in student service is small groups. We don't get to do those here. Not yet. I'm praying that God changes that. But I want you to go out into this world when we leave here today and find a group of people from Calvary Church Fam and do life with them Monday through Friday. Talk to them about what we're about to talk about. Work these things out. Go deep. Christ didn't just serve the world with his family and then leave and never hang out and do life with them and eat dinner with them. It was both and. So some of these things that I want you to do this week for application um, that are going to help us live out the big idea. And here's why it's important to go and do these things. Cliches rarely help and often get in the way. But Christ came to help and be the way. And there's no other way. He's our only hope. And so this week, I want you to ask yourself some questions. Take time and do, um, do some serious evaluation. Pray. Talk these things out, work them out. But the one, evaluate how often you use faith cliches. Do you use them regularly when giving advice to your kids? Parents, listen to me. If you give cliche advice to your kids, their faith will be nothing. It will be very shallow, and when they leave and experience the world, they will, they will leave faith. Cliches do not hold up to the enemy. There's not enough truth in them. We need the truth. So take time. Don't be a rushed parent. Think about how much time do you get with your kiddos? Maybe four hours if they're in public school and they ride the bus and you both, both parents work jobs and then maybe you got four hours. If you homeschool them, how much time do you have to focus on God's plan for their life rather than uh, setting them up for success in the world based off of school? Take time for these things. Don't use shortcuts with cliches. And then once you see how often you use them, I want you to challenge them. I want you to be a Berean. Anything we ever say, myself or Brother Randy say, you should not take it as fact. You should challenge it to God's word. No pastor you follow should you ever take as what God's word is. You should take God's word for God's word. What better way to learn how to trust your leader than to see, wow, that is what God's word says. Or maybe it gives you the other direction. I hope that it does not. I know that we do our best to never do anything that is not of God's word. So now, challenge these cliches. What scripture supports your cliche? In context, don't you dare take context, scripture out of context. All right, that's not the way it is. It means what it means, not what you want it to mean. You will exegete, not eisegete. Exegete means you'll take from scripture, not eisegete, which means put into scripture. What I mean is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is another great scripture cliche. Oh really, you can lift an elephant? You can start a successful business? Because Christ strengthens you? No, that's not what that scripture means. So don't, don't, don't compare your cliches to scripture. Don't support your bias. It's a very common thing. You'll find something that, see, is what it says. Whoa, 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 challenge it. Look for scripture that could defeat it or support it. And then another one um, is how often you use them could be a gauge of your personal walk. And here's what I mean by that. We're called to be lights, not flashing lights. Boom, there's a cliche. There's some God for you. Boom, boom. No, we're supposed to be bright and live by them. And so, how often do you use them? Do you use them in your personal conversations, meaningful conversations that might be an opportunity to show Christ? Do you even use them? You, you may say, Seth, this is stupid. I sat here this whole time. I don't use Christian cliches. Okay. But do you actually give wisdom and advice to your friends and people you do life with based off of God's plan or just your own understanding of what might work? Sometimes cliches are an indicator that at least you're trying to point them towards God. Sometimes not, might be. I'm not saying that it is. I'm not saying to go use more cliches. Please, I don't want to teach this again. I'm saying take time. Study God's word. Don't just read it. Learn it. Study it. Using a cliche is more along the lines of the way the enemy used scripture. A little bit of truth just to make you think it's from God, but it never leads to life. And besides, not knowing God's word is part of what created those weak, lame cliches in the first place. And so as Graham comes back up to play us a song, I want you to think about, do we want to prove to people that the best is yet to come? Like we sang this morning? 
do want to prove to people that we are blameless. Like Paul says, yet still sinners. We're not sinners anymore, according to that scripture and what God had done for us on the cross through.